Good morning and welcome to our fourth, third Thursday, um, which is going to focus on assessment. At this point in the year, halfway through, we want to have uh, an eye on where our students are in the journey to where they need to be at the end of the year. And we need to be aware of the fact that going into this unprecedented year, there was a time element of two to three months of extra time that was needed with students in order to truly be able to facilitate the learning of meeting goals for the grade that they're in right now. We didn't have that. And so the meeting of the mastery of those skills this year is not as important as making sure that the skills that the students are gaining, they're mastering and not just being introduced to. And how do we do that? We do that through constant and regular assessment. So today, I want you to take some time as we go through this third Thursday, just to pause and really reflect. This isn't a third Thursday that's necessarily going to have a tremendous amount of information that you now need to learn. It's more of a third Thursday that's going to ask you to reflect upon your instructional pra practices, your routines in your classroom, and how much of that is linked to formative assessment, which allows you to alter and realign your instruction to meet the student's needs. And part of what that's going to do, that pausing and looking at it, is that we you know, are going to be able to do these things. You're gonna strengthen your understanding through this third Thursday of feedback and formative assessment and the effect on learning. You're going to evaluate your instructional practices to make sure that you're offering equitable instruction. And then really think about, I'll give you some information on distance learning and the impact that it's had and just the wonderful job that we have actually been able to do with having our students back um, and in the unique setting of a Catholic private school in comparison to really what is going on for students that are not coming back to campus, have not been able to gather and Teachers are not able to have them turn on their screens, um, communicate in collaborative ways. So at the end of this, having studied that through this third Thursday, you should be able to implement formative assessment daily and then cause that um, formative assessment to help you align with your instructional goals. You should be able to provide feedback that moves learning forward and manage schedules so that you can truly provide that equitable instruction. I want you to think about the quote that's on this page. I know teachers are absolutely exhausted, but what we want to make sure is happening is students should be equally exhausted, not just the teachers and not the parents. They should be equally or more exhausted. And if that's not happening, then part of your exhaustion is dragging these students along. So we need to get these students walking in the car, fix the broken uh, leg, fix the flat tire. Think about it that if your students are not truly aware of where they are in their learning, monitoring their learning, and able to do the sub skills for the skills in the units that you're teaching, you're having to drag them through that. And it's enough effort and enough work as a teacher to be able to present the lessons, to grade the lessons, to creatively assign and discuss the lessons. When you have to drag the students through because they're not able to participate in the lesson is a factor that truly leads to that exhaustion. And so I want you to really just take some time to reflect right now. I'm exhausted, I'm sure is what you're thinking. Are my students equally exhausted? Or am I the one that's being asked to do all of this? So we need to slow our pace, realign what we're doing, and make sure that those students are truly the ones that are doing the work because we're engaging them in something that they can do and we're forcing them to do that work 
rather than accepting the fact that maybe they can or cannot and we drag them through. Stop, pause, realign, and get those students engaged in the working process so they too are exhausted right now from what's going on. So today we're going to talk a little bit. We'll begin with Renaissance Star because there's a, a really interesting report that I'm going to ask you to pause this um, third Thursday webinar and go to your Renaissance Star and look at that just to see where your students are. You might be pleasantly surprised. You might be overwhelmed with what you see that you're working with right now and if you're trying to go on when they don't have mastery of subskills. So we're going to start with Renaissance Star and I'm going to show you a couple paths <clears throat> and reports that I want you to review periodically. Then we're going to go over formative assessments, <clears throat> feedback, questioning, and rethinking your schedule so that you can provide this equitable instruction. So let's start with the STAR um, report that I'm talking about. It's going to be linked here. And when you go to Renaissance, it's going to look something like this. So what you want to do now is you're going to want to pause. When you go to Renaissance, you are going to want to go to either STAR Math or Reading. Once you get there, you want to scroll down to Reports. When you open up Reports, you want to scroll down until you get to the State Standards Mastery Class Report. When you click on that, just make sure that you are in your class. And when you go down, it will give you the standards for the grade level that you are teaching. Make sure that in the upper right-hand corner, there's a little toggle, and it says um, Expected. Make sure that you click that so that's on. And when you're looking at this report, you'll see there's not only going to be a score, but there's going to be a score in a circle. The score in the circle is where you expect the student to be at the end of the year. The score in the box is where that student is now. So the value in this report is if you are teaching a skill, you want to be aware of where your students are with their sub skills to be prepared to do that work. If you look at your report and you see that students are not at grade level with different skills, you have to pause what you're doing and go back and work on that or you are going to be dragging students through content that there is no way that they are ready for. And what you need to know is that at the diocesan level, you are being supported in that. We need to make sure that students are learning and not being dragged through content that they don't understand. So to maintain a curriculum map or to maintain a schedule at the expense of the student truly learning is not what's being advocated at the diocesan level. So I want you to pause now. I want you to go to this report and I want to look you to look at your class makeup and go through the different standards and see truly your students' grade level competency at what you're doing and teaching. And as you start your units, you want to look at this and consider where are my students, which ones am I going to need to support differently because of the skills they have or don't have, and which ones am I going to be able to extend. Okay, now that you've seen that, the other link here is for focus skills grade K through 8. We've had a lot of people that asked for focus skills. So when you click on this link, it's going to take you to something that looks like this. And you're going to go down to where you get focus skills. And you're going to see you have to choose math or literacy. Obviously, we're California. And when you click here, if you want to view, say, let's say grade 5, there's 22 focus skills. So when you're looking at that, you just really is the familiarity for you so that you're aware of what your students and the skills your students are supposed to be ha gaining this year. You can go back to the grade before and see the skills that they were supposed to have gained then. And as, um, as you're teaching with this, with this eye on formative assessment, you're just constantly questioning your students, um, challenging them um, with activities or questions that you're giving so that you can get an idea of the skills that they have and if they're ready to progress on or you need to pause and go back. 
And that's what this is about. Not following the pace in your resource, not following the pace perhaps that's dictated by you know the state or the standardized test, but following the pace that your students need in order to become proficient, confident, and the ones that are all um, doing the walking, doing the moving in the learning, and you're not dragging them. So um, I hope that those two help you so you have a good understanding of um, where your students are, because that's what uh, assessment is all about and the feedback is all about. Let's talk, There's a, um, and this is something I'm sure you're familiar with, but I want to go over it. You know, in assessment, we have formative and summative. Summative is the grade. And although summative is very, very important, there's not much that a student can do with a summative except accept the grade. Now you can turn a summative assessment into a formative if you allow the student to do the summative assessment over. They can look at it, they can learn from it, and they can take that assessment again or create that project again. But typically, a summative assessment doesn't offer a student a tremendous amount of hope unless you are going to allow them to redo it, which I believe is fine. A formative assessment on the other side is full of hope. It's just a checkpoint, but not only for the teacher, it needs to be a checkpoint for the student. And so they're aware of, wait a minute, I can't go on, I don't get this. And that's the sort of autonomy that if you have that um, in your students, you're not going to be dragging them because they are going to be aware of where they need to be and they're gonna stop. And you're gonna and there you're gonna allow them to teach there, and you can focus your energy on either supporting that, or a student that needs you in another area. But you're not going to be dragging students that don't need to go on. Formative assessment also happens regularly in your lesson plans. You should be able to have a question when you're when you're writing out your lesson plans. You want to make sure that you write in that formative assessment question. And if a, a principal or a teacher says, uh, what was the formative that you used in order to align your instruction? You should be able to refer back to some sort of a question. We talk about this as an exit ticket per se. Something interesting that um, I came upon through some brain-based learning webinars this summer was that you don't want to do exit tickets right at the end of the class period, which is actually what we were advocating. Students at that point are closing down, they're moving on, their minds are somewhere else. Think about doing those exit tickets in the beginning. Think about doing those formative assessments in the beginning before your lesson so that you see where they are as they're ready to begin. Um, something very interesting that you can do with formative assessment is you can do your true-false quizzes. I hope you're not grading true-false quizzes and adding those as summative assessments. Those are simply guesses. And um, they don't have great value as a summative assessment with a grade in a grade book. But what true-false quizzes are great with can be your formative assessment. When students realize that they're taking this quiz, not necessarily for a grade, but to have a checkpoint of their understanding, they're more likely to engage. And when you ask a question or when you start your lesson with a review where you tell the students what you did and what you're gonna start, they're not actively engaged. But when you start your lesson with a true-false quiz, and the students have to try to remember what they learned the day before or the learning that they're doing right now or the, the math equation or components that they're studying, they're actively engaged. And that's going to be a better assessment for you. Um, we wanna think about feedback. Um, it, the wonderful thing about feedback, it's discussing work that's been done, but so that that affects the work that will be done in the future. And so students want to get used to feedback from you. Feedback is one of the, the biggest um, factors that can change student learning. Um, so if student, you, we want students where they're not just used to getting a letter. What does a letter tell them? You want students that are getting descriptive feedback, which means it's challenging to th um, them to see how well they know it, um, what they actually did in order to show that they knew it, 
um, and perhaps what they don't know and where, what they need to do. So um, in previous uh, webinars, and I'll review that, I've talked to you about having students use success criteria and learning tensions where they um, have templates where they monitor their learning. And when you are giving that good descriptive feedback on units or lessons that you're doing, students can use that if they know exactly the path for the goal to show mastery of the unit that they're in. They can use that feedback to say, okay, I'm here, I need to work on this. And that's what feedback should do. It should give the learners answers to the questions of, okay, where am I? You're writing a three paragraph essay. I can't do transitions. I don't understand a thesis statement. Students need to know that, not just I got to see. So we really want to have a, a good idea. And as we're going through this webinar, that's what you're thinking about. How do I do a formative assessment daily? And what techniques do I do? And where do I put that in my schedule? And once I get that information from an observation or a quiz, what do I do to my instruction? Do I pause and realign or do I go on? And you want to be um, reflecting now, what kind of feedback am I doing? Do I do um, descriptive feedback? Do I do feedback that's just a letter grade? Do I do feedback regularly? Do I do a conference? Do I allow students to have feedback with each other? And those components of uh, formative assessment and feedback are critical to your students having the energy to work and the interest to work so that you do not get exhausted dragging them along. And like I said, provide feedback that moves learning on. It should cause thinking. It should provide guidance on how to improve. It's a comment only. It is not a grade. Okay, it allows you to focus the grading. You want to have explicit reference to rubrics in your feedback. When students truly know what does success look like, and then when your feedback addresses, well, th this, is, this is where I see success, and then you may even want to say, if I asked you to comment back on your work, where do you see or not see that you did that? Uh, a really fun um, way to give feedback, because <clears throat> sometimes students don't necessarily want to read the comments, you might want to practice by creating strips of feedback and then putting out essays. And these don't have to be student essays. You can find um, you know, ones that are outside of your class so you don't have any sense of insecurity with students. What essay would this feedback go with and where did we see it? What a learning experience. You know, if you said something like, I see good descriptive language, if I see excellent transitions, students would look at the feedback, they'd look at the essays, they'd have to determine which came with which, where they found that in the essay. That's a teaching assignment. Being able to do or not do that tells you that that student is ready to move on with that skill. So that, that reference rubric, rubrics and that strategy of uh, matching the assessment to the task is um, really fun and creative for students and might be able to be a good formative assessment. And also your feedback always needs to give suggestions on how to improve. Think about that, that first quote from the first slide of this webinar. When you see a student that's dug themselves into a pit, you know, we're dealing with students that are five years old to 13. When they say something horrific like, this stinks, I'm not doing this, I can't stand it, I hate this. That's immaturity, and we cannot leave students to navigate their future in that immature state. So we have to have the relationship with the student that we look at them then and we say, you know what, you're in a pit. I know how to get out. Take my hand, I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna show you the way out of this pit. And so our feedback always has to offer hope and suggestions of how they can improve but we don't want to give them the complete solution. We want to make sure that they can find it. And you want to think about too, when you're doing these assessments, maybe what's your timing on them? When do you get them? How frequently? How regularly? What time in your lesson? 
Something that you need to consider is that acceptance of the feedback is going to determine your relationship or going to be um, determined on your relationship with your students. And so I have linked here um, the webinar on relationships with students. So you want to make sure what are you doing? Greeting them at the door. How are you talking with them? Are you having those conversations? Are you taking five minutes a day? Are you still trying to? And I know these sound like, oh my gosh, I don't have time. But remember, feedback, formative assessment, and making sure you have these healthy relationships is going to be what allows you to not drag the students. And I believe part of the exhaustion is by dragging these students through. Now these are crazy times and a lot of your exhaustion is because you're working in an environment that is unfamiliar with technology that's unfamiliar. And I understand that and it's unfortunate and I'm so thankful for your efforts. But I believe that we still need to be very mindful of that relationship. So if you have any questions about how do I, what are some activities I could do, I've linked that. You want to make, might want to go back and review that so that you make sure you have healthy student-teacher relationships. So let's move on to questioning strategies. Um, we want to make sure that when we offer a question that there's not necessarily a right, wrong answer, but that they're open-ended so that students can really show the depth of their knowledge. And they're not just recalling information, but it's allowing them to engage in deeper thinking and in, and in um, conversation. You also want to think of what you're doing with those incorrect and correct responses. Because um, something that's interesting, and I hope that I've said it, is that when you're giving feedback or you're questioning, the same should be done for great work as is done where work where there's errors. Because if students don't get used to really being observed what they're doing really well, um, that, that's not fair to the learners that are doing that. And that, that won't allow them to progress as well. But you want to think about when you're looking at this, you know, do you continue moving those students? Do you continue challenging those students with cues, clues, probes, rephrasing, redirect, and that you're holding them accountable and coming back later with more questions to that incorrect response? Very important. I want you to look at the bottom of the screen and think about it that as you reflect. If you're always doing this questioning, have the students do it. Assign them questions. Tomorrow I want you to come up with a question that's going to question the mastery or question your peers on if they understand this. Have them come up with a question. Hold them accountable um, for the ability to rephrase. Okay, so-and-so doesn't know the answer. Who can rephrase that question in a different way? Give them a cue, a clue. Um, support that with different technology tools. And you'll see I'll give you some ideas. Um, you might want to keep a formative assessment clipboard when you're doing your questioning um, where you keep track of that. Remember, that's not a grade that they're going to get, but it allows you to go, this group's ready to move forward, this group's not, I'm going to have to come back and give more questions. You know, you can send them little conference notes. You know, this is what we did today, and, and this is where I saw you in this process, and so you're really going to have to work on this tonight. If you, um, we'll talk a little bit later about how you want to schedule your time in order to be able to um, uh, facilitate this. Maybe you have Fridays. Maybe you have Wednesdays off early. You need to go back and use technology to work on this. You need to practice through maybe technology and the, and the remediation programs you have because I see that you're lacking in this and I think that you need to work on it more and you're going to have more success the next day. Um, I've also um, uh, attached this here. These are the templates and, and this is what I'm advocating that you work on. Um, have your students do this as you're going through your units. What am I working on? What questions have, do I have? What am I now able to do? Where do I need to go back? Um, this sort of uh, monitoring that you're doing, they should be doing. And keeping them engaged like this is going to allow them to expel some of the energy that you're having to expel now and be equally exhausted but also learning in this task. Um, this gives you some ideas. If you're asking them to show and you're trying to do the formative assessment, you don't want to take time in class, you ask these questions, students put their answers on a padlet, maybe they have to um, answer through a 
Flipgrid, maybe you have polling through Mentimeter, which I've given you before, um, if you like doing it anonymously, just so you get a general idea of where the class is. There's plenty of tools out there. And remember, if you're not comfortable in this, please contact me. I'm willing to walk with you and help you um, develop the aptitude so that you feel comfortable using tools like this to help you with your formative assessment as you're doing your lessons. We want to look at unpacking our formative assessment because we want to think of it like this. Oops, let's go back. This, this is a chart you need to understand. Everyone's involved. It's not all on you. We all need to be aware of where the learner is going. We all need to know about how to get there. And you want to see so much of this is peers and the learner. And so just be aware that through formative assessment and through feedback, you can engage the students actively in a way that's not going to exhaust you. And here are some five, you know, I want you to reflect on this later. Like I said, think about if, if your formative assessment, if your feedback is allowing this. Because if that is not truly a part, then your students are not really having that ownership of learning which is perhaps causing part of the exhaustion. So as we're getting near the end, how can we schedule and include time for do-overs, redos, and corrections? I want to look at our schedules. Do If we slowed our pace a little bit, if we opened up a Friday, if we have Wednesday where students get let out early, can that be a time? Can that formative assessment and that realignment be something that I schedule into my time rather than rushing to, through to a summative assessment that is going to be frustrating and perhaps not give me the result that the teacher or the student is looking for, but I had to get there because of the pace I'm on. Think about your pace and your schedule. Do you need win time? Uh, I know that one of the high schools in um, the diocese scheduled win time what I need. And so students having that cognitive understanding of being aware of where they are in order to do well on that summative assessment, um, they'll see and engage in formative assessment. And that's a lifelong skill that you want to teach them in their learning. So as we did earlier um, with, our form, with our work, what do I need to keep doing? What do I need to start doing? And what do I need to stop doing? Um, so this goes back, obviously it's a big change in, in look from a previous webinar, but I, I think that that's very important that you reflect upon, and like I said, we're reflecting upon what we're doing in order to be the most efficient teacher. Uh, I've linked here some resources for you if um, you're interested in this, that they give excellent ideas, um, they give PowerPoints. But um, I think one that was particularly interesting is Dylan William. He has many tutorials, many short 15-minute videos. But those will offer you the food that you need in order to know that formative assessment and feedback is probably one of the most important practices, particularly with students who are not performing well. So Rick Wormelli, um, Fisher and Fry, Dylan William, all excellent resources that you can look up. You can watch five, 10, 15 minute YouTube videos um, that will help you. And remember, this practice is meant to allow you to go forward in a way that's not as exhausting. And for middle school teachers, that this is an excellent article that I've linked here. So thank you very much for joining me today. And uh, I look forward to being able to meet with you again. I hope you are all healthy. Have a wonderful day.